Everybody, welcome to the Personal Web Podcast Network. I'm Chris Leonard with the Sickles and Noise Podcast. Uh, with me, I have Russ Long from the Front of House Fridays Podcast. Uh, we have some fun stuff for you tonight. Uh, before we jump into that, real quick though, um, if you uh, if you're under a rock uh, right now and you weren't aware, but tonight is uh, Red Alert. We make events. Um, you know, everyone's lighting up their businesses, their homes with red. Uh, to, uh, contact your congressman. Uh, you can go to We Make events.org uh, to participate into that. Uh, I encourage you to do so, hence also why I got red behind me. Um, also, just a quick shout out, Russ and I are wearing shirts from the clinic. Um, go to therotoclinic.com. Uh, we really support what it is that they are doing for our industry, um, and they are here just for our families. They're here for our roadies. Uh, they're, they're doing a good thing. So uh, make sure you go uh, check them out. So um, if you're not familiar, Russ is the, the host of Front of House Fridays. Russ, what is Front of House Fridays? Front of the House Fridays is a podcast uh, that came about during this COVID time when Front of House takes on an entirely different meaning. And I had the idea of going to talk to uh, Front of House engineers, which uh, I always love to go to shows and hang out with a Front of House engineer. But Front of House takes on an entirely new meaning now. So instead of going to their Front of House mix position, I go in front of their house and we social distance and we record a conversation between us. We talk about uh, gear, we talk about tours, we talk about being on the road, working with musicians, the challenges, the, the um, things that, that keep us dry, driven and keep us going and, and all things touring. And it's been a, been a really great thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. So what do we, uh, who do we have with us tonight? Uh, we got a couple of great people. First of all, uh, while well, best known as Carrie Underwood's front of house engineer, Tim Holder is also a studio owner and engineer, as well as a 1970s vintage studio audio enthusiast. He's based in Nashville. He has over 20 years uh, experience working for Claire Global. And in addition to uh, mixing Carrie Underwood, Tim he's, has toured with uh, Simon and Garfunkel, Steven Tyler, Kenny Chesney, Enrique Iglesias, and John Fogarty, as well as tons of others. Uh, Tim was originally a musician. His musician roots had him at touring as a bass player in the 80s and 90s before he made the move to being a uh, front of house engineer. Um, and he's he's great. Uh, and then second, like myself, uh, my friend Paul Andrews is a Colorado transplant who now lives in Nashville. In addition to being a global sales support and business development manager for DPA Microphones, which has him traveling around the world conducting workshops and live seminars for DPA Microphones. Um, he's a fantastic studio engineer. He's the owner of Nashville's Bridge Recording Studios. He's recorded everyone from Chris Christopherson, Boys to Men, and Victor Wooten, to Dennis Chambers, Peter Erskine, and Great White, and tons of others. And to top it all off, he's a fabulous guitar player. So we really got a couple of great guys uh, to look at our topic, which um, is the complete signal path from musician or vocalist all the way through to the audience. Um, and I think as 
engineers, it's really easy to lose track of the big picture. Um, it's easy to think that if you got the perfect vocal mic or you've got the perfect console, it's all going to be great. But that's not true. Every step of the way uh, is important. And I don't think there's anybody better equipped to talk to us about that tonight than uh, Tim Holder. Uh, Tim is a stunningly good uh, live engineer. Uh, Carrie Underwood's shows are known for being some of the best sounding in the industry. And the first thing I want to have Tim talk about is his front of house mix position, which is a very unique and innovative uh, uh, approach to uh, the whole concept, um, which you can see a photo of now. But Tim, go ahead. Talk a little bit about how, how you approach front of house. Well, hey, everybody. How's it going? Uh, wow. So this came out from necessity on this tour. Uh, Carrie's last tour was uh, in the round, basically, uh, you know, the, the set literally consumed the entire hockey arena floor. So there was no traditional front of house mix position as we know it. You know, usually you're in the center of the room in between the two speaker columns, you know, about a hundred feet from the stage, but you know, that, that just didn't exist that, you know, the, the entire floor was the stage. So the intention was to have me mix from the ADA uh, decks. Um, and, you know, they were less than ideal. Um, you never really got in the center of a left and right array. Uh, we had six uh, or main arrays around the, the oval shaped stage. And uh, so you were just kind of stuck with what you're given with. And often, you know, the, the deck was just a hollow boomy deck that, that created this false low end. Uh, always you were too close to the PA. Uh, I mean, literally 55, 60 feet away um and you know it just was less than ideal it's, i'd say you know so i never really was happy with that but that's that's what the gig was and we we soldiered on until i don't remember the city it was but we were told there were going to be one or two venues where there just weren't going to be these ada decks available so the venue would they they built their own risers well when we get there at rigging call and check this out, you know, there's, there's no way to get the gear onto the riser. <laughs> I mean, it's a slight uh, oversight there. So it just wasn't going to happen. So we looked for an alternative space. I tried the monitors and the playback guys were on the stage. Uh, I'm sorry, on the floor by the stage. Uh, I tried that. It's just too close. Couldn't get the left, right. I tried another position on the floor. It just, you know, those boxes are shaded, you know, it just wasn't the full energy. It just didn't feel right at all. So we went for the bomb and uh, I was very apprehensive about it. Um, but the results were really good. Um, and from that first shot, uh, you know, I really worked with my systems engineer, Dave Chateau, who's a great guy. Um, he really understood what I was looking for. And uh, I had an established two mix. You know, I had been working for a good month or so with the band uh, in rehearsals. So, um, you know, I was mixing to a, a known source um, and uh, it was a great reference. And uh, so I developed this relationship with, with Dave and, um, you know, got to trust his ears and he got to know exactly what I wanted. And, you know, I have pretty extensive uh, systems engineer background as well. So we could talk the talk and, and uh, it really worked. It really, uh, it, it was, it was one, it turned out to be one of the, the most pleasurable, you know, mixing experiences I've ever had. It really was nice. Oh, that's great. So do you think the fact that you're using the, Claire speakers that in your space that are voiced, you know, that have a similar tone. Is that part of what? Yeah, makes there's. Work? I'm sorry, there is definitely something about that uh, because they are designed. It's part of the cohesion system, um, and they are designed to work together. Uh, the the mix. Uh, you can't really see uh, that picture there, but uh, uh, there's a there's a sub as well. Uh, CP 118 powered sub and two CP 6 uh, powered speakers. And uh, I have everything time aligned, and it's just a really great full range reference of, of what the PA is doing. And it just <clears throat> translates so well. 
It really does. And do you think this is something that um, would be an easy transition transition for most front of house guys, or do you think part partially because you're you've got such a studio background that mixing in a you know with a more of a near field type speaker did that make it easier for you? Do you think, or do you think it would be Absolutely. easy for anybody? It, it really made that a lot easier for me. I mean, I, uh, you know, I've had extensive hours, you know, here in my studio behind the monitors. I mean, it's, it's, I, I've really grown accustomed to, to that style of mixing. Um, you know, in the right situation, of course, you always want to be in the room with, with the source, but it just, you know, wasn't going to, it wasn't possible. It really wasn't. And, and, I, I really think our results uh, would are, are, are were better than what they would have been if I were in the room, for sure. Uh, the end result is great. Well, that's awesome. I mean, what a really great uh, solution to a, uh, a huge, you know, a huge uh, issue that you you ran into. Mm -hmm. um, so, in talking about um, sound source through to the audience, um, brings me back. My very first tour was. Um, Jerry Reed tour back in 1989. I was mixing monitors and um, I had been a, I'm a recovered drummer. Uh, and, um, and so I hit it off with the drummer pretty well. And we did a lot of talking and stuff. And um, the front of house guy came to me after, um, uh, I don't know, second or third show of the, this tour and said, man, I can't make anything happen with this snare drum. It just sounds terrible since you kind of have a repertoire with the drummer maybe you can talk to him and maybe we can get him to tweak this uh this hmm. drum sound a bit and make it a little better so i went up to him uh you know the next day at load in and just said hey you know your, your snare drum he goes oh man are you loving it too it's taken <laughs> 10 years to get that drum head sounding that good and um and I realized at that point that, um, yeah, there's no change in uh, that. He's had that drum head for 10 years. He's finally happy with it. Uh, we're going to have to figure out a way to make it work outside of, a, uh, you know, go go a different path, whether it's switching mics or, or inserting something or whatever. But you guys have any, Paul or Tim, you guys have any examples of a, a situation where you found yourself having to make some kind of a change in the sound source or, or where you had a repertoire strong enough with a band member where you could suggest some change or something that you really needed to do to make the uh the situation better uh myself i mean yeah you often do you often do run across these types of situations and you have to be so political when you correct i mean oh you i mean like you say you, you, the wrong word just would have destroyed you know <laughs> the guy's uh 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 opinion of his, his snare there and uh you really have to be careful you know to dance around the artists and 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 their feelings <laughs> uh that said uh always an honest approach is the best um and you know everybody wants to make the sound as best as they can and uh you know that's the approach you have to have with the artist when you feel there is a problem what do you got paul yeah no i agree with that it's um you're you're doing that that sensitivity dance in and yeah. around that, and and if you can, you know, sometimes it, if you can pre-record something and have them walk out into the house, and you know, before you say, you know, just have a listen. What do you think about your snare? What's going on here? And they're either going to love it or hate it, and and hopefully they're going to side with you so that they're like, yeah, it's it's got a little bit too much of this or that. Let's see if we can correct it. You know, so. You, you do have to be super sensitive with them and and but like you said they're on the same team and they want to make yes. sure that you know they're achieving that sound that that is going to fit best into the mix and that is going to be pleasing for everyone mm -hmm. yeah yeah and there's a trust factor too i think i mean if you've toured with somebody for five or six years or whatever then generally you could be a little more upfront because they'd know they trust you or whatever, exactly, but I mean, if, if yeah. it's early on, right. I think that's great words, Paul, mm -hmm. that the idea that let them make the call, let them put, put the ball in their court and let them hear it and realize, Oh yeah, there may be a, a little issue uh, with that. Um, well, let's start with the drum kit because uh, uh, so many people think of that as the foundation of the, or the backbone of the band. Tim, how do you uh, approach Mike and the, the drums? you know both from anything unique placement wise or mic wise or or both you know 
Uh, well, one of the things that uh, I do that most people, well, that I don't do that most people do, you know, but the, it's very popular to have the, the, you know, the two separate microphones in the kick drum, a uh, dynamic and a, and a condenser, uh, the boom and the chick. Uh, you know, it's never really been my thing. Uh, anytime you introduce two microphones, you know, the, the issues with phase and uh, timing and all that, you know, comes into play. Uh, of course, you can get it right. Um, studio situation, absolutely. But live, it's just, I've, I've just been, you know, you get everything tweaked and you go up right before you go on and put your hands on everything and get it just like you want it. You've been through the sound check. Everything sounded great. But all it takes is a, is a mic to move an inch and, and you know, your alignment, uh, all that work is, got, is, is, is out the window. So I, I, I prefer to get, you know, a good sound just using one mic. Um, and lately, uh, my mics of choice have been the DPA mics. Uh, I really like the 2011 C in the, in the kick drum. Um, it's a real tight, punchy sound. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not one for the big, loose, boomy, uh, kind of a, kind of a kick sound. I'd rather have it, you know, kick you right in the, in the gut, you know? Um, and that 2011 is a great mic. Also the, the 4099 is, is really good as well. Um, both of those mics are great choices for a kick drum. Um, mic placements. I mean, I prefer to have the mic, you know, right around the sound hole, <clears throat> but you have to be wary of that, you know, the size of the hole and the amount of air. Um, I almost always use uh, a windscreen on a condenser. Um, but that's where, and, and, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people want to get that, that uh, attack sounds, you know, with, with, uh, I, I, I always, I, 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 that's more something I do with processing and, and uh, compression, uh, that, that texture, uh, you know, the right microphone, the right drum, the right player. Cool. You know, yeah. You know, you know, that's <clears throat> interesting point you bring up there. I almost want to back up, uh, even oh. before the microphone, obviously <clears throat> we're talking about the drums themselves, the instruments, but the player, Oh yes. you know, and, and I was thinking about that, that single mic technique that that you love on on the kick and and as do i it's absolutely fantastic and i think if you have the player who can truly listen and play with dynamics and mm -hmm. it's it's appropriate to the tune that's actually being played at the moment that single mic inside the kick is is the perfect combination but i found that if if you've got somebody who is is you know, just all out all the time, or they just don't have quite the finesse that you're looking for. I've oftentimes had to fall back to to using a two mic setup so that I can have those set up on, on you know, my first two faders or whatever that is, and I'll blend that kick depending on the song. So if it's if it's a high energy type of a thing and I want more more of the hammer you know, that cuts through, or if it backs off and it's more of a ballad type of a song, that I'll, then I'll push the the dynamic up a little bit and give a little bit more of a pulsating type of a, of mm -hmm. a kick sound, you know, so it's more appropriate to the tune. But mm -hmm. if you've got that drummer who can do it naturally by themselves, perfect, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah that's always the best case when, you know, when, it, when it comes from the player himself, you okay. know, or herself. Yeah. And there's something, I'm not sure what it is because I'm not a... Um, in monitor mixer and that scares me to death. But uh, I mean, I, I like you, Tim, I prefer one mic, but we always have two because the monitor, every monitor engineer I work with always says yeah. he needs two for the ears to make it work right. So right. something That's... happens different in the ears, I think, than is happening in the room. And it, it be, and I don't deny that they are they know what they're doing. These are great monitor engineers, but they say they got to have two, two mics to make it work. Yeah, I mean, I get it. I've been on the other end of the snake and there's there's, a lot more going on there. Uh, you know, some people use one mic only in the sub, uh, you know, some one, another mic only in wedges, different mic combination in the ears. Um, you know, there's a lot of variation going on there. And two, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. I, uh, that, that second mic, I always keep it on the surface. Uh, believe it or not, I've had a, a mic fail 
once, and that oh, that's that's well, yeah, yeah, there's a save the show. <laughs> yeah, because you can't. I mean, you can do a show without a second rack tom mic, but you can't do yeah. a show without a kick drum. Yeah, so uh, a little, <laughs> little rough. Right. Um, so um, uh, to what what about snare drum? What's snare your drum. Oh, uh, you know, um, the standard, the rock and roll industry standards, the SM57. The audio hammer. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a standard. However, I really prefer the DPA 2011C. Again, you know, it's it's uh, it takes the SPL. It uh, it's just translates that crack. It's, it uh, has the headroom. Um, it's a great mic. It really is. Um, yeah, it's, that's it's, it, it's my go-to. I think it's go-to <laughs> for almost everybody. You know, it's um. It's pretty cool because the the C uh, the 2011C the 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 letter f standing for the preamp um, not to geek out too much but mm -hmm. I think part of the reason I love it so much on the snare is because it's a transformer based preamp right. and it the harder it's pushed it'll enter in t those third order harmonics mm -hmm. which are just an absolute pleasing thing you know on anything that's got texture or grain I, to it that must be why it sounds so great on guitar as well i think so yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah. um what, what do you use for overheads ah um well um uh, on carry i prefer the the dpa 4011s uh that's just a fantastic microphone on carry we were we were limited um uh, so it's hard to explain uh, the drum riser was actually a lift, uh, like an, uh, it wasn't hydraulic, but it was a motorized lift. Um, it was not the size, it was not eight by eight. It was actually smaller than that. Um, and the kit just barely fit onto this riser. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so, I mean, we had to be very, you know, like, uh, we ended up, we ended up using, uh, for monitor purposes, uh, the Steger SR2N stereo mic. It was uh, it's a stereo ribbon, and uh, that was that was that was really for his in ears uh, to get that natural sound. <clears throat> and then uh, we didn't have room to put the you know proper boom mics up for the uh, you know traditional type overheads, and we couldn't put them where they needed to be as well. You know, the mic placement wasn't correct, so uh, we kind of went with something similar that uh, the previous tour had used, uh, although the, as far as the position, uh, we were miking the three symbols underneath, uh, which worked out really well for the for the ride, but not so much with, for the other two symbols. I didn't really, uh, I wasn't that happy with what I was getting with the mic placement. And that, they were Bayer uh, 930 amps, I believe, uh, which is a great mic. It just wasn't the correct placement because where our hands were tied with the space and that kind of thing. <clears throat> so, I ended up using a lot of the uh, of the Steger rhythm mic, and it was it was good. It sounded good, but it, it my my choice would have been forty elevens. You know, it just didn't work out for real estate in that particular scenario. <clears throat> Paul, can you tell us a little bit about? I know you have a pretty unique uh, approach to uh, overheads. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. So thinking about the 4d11s or or any other type of cardioid i think it's super important to make sure that you understand what you really want to represent within the overheads because a lot of people mic thinking that they are overhead mics when they actually are ultimately becoming symbol mics right so depending on the way they want to process them or the t depending on on the proximity to where they actually are placing those is it is it you know above or below the symbols? Well, or are you trying to capture the entire kit as an ensemble? And if that's the case, you know, thinking about uh, a really transparent cardioid microphone, one that has both good and on and off axis representation, I think is super important because the way that all comes together is it's going to remain <coughs> in phase as long as you've got your positioning proper. And so one thing that I really like to do is I like to not only measure the distance from the center of the snare 
up to my left and right overhead, but I also like to pay attention to the distance off of the toms. So as you can see here in this picture, I'm making almost a triangular fashion. This looks really funny, funny from, uh, you know, if you're sitting behind the kit or standing in front of it, because you're like so used to seeing this, this traditional look where these two are like right overhead and, and they're like perfectly, you know, balanced between the kit and so forth. And this looks like somebody maybe pushed one out of the way, you know, uh, Tim's, Tim's yeah. laughing because yeah. you know. <laughs> we have a funny little story. Paul and I worked together at uh, the latest NAM show and uh, DPA provided all the mics and, and Paul and some of his, uh, compadres did all the, the miking, uh, you know, in between the, the set changes and everything. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it was probably the, you know, third band. Paul came up to me. It's like, are you are you moving these overhead mics? I said, no, no, it's not me. Well, somebody keeps moving. And we, you know, we calculated where they should be. And, you know, it's no, it's a lot of work involved here. And and like I look up and they've been moved to this symmetrical thing. So it was it was. Uh, you know, it was the local guys not really understanding what we were doing and, you know, oh, that looks bad. So they <laughs> symmetrically put them up so that it looks, you know, looks good on video, right? Well, right. you know, we don't care what it looks like. We care what it sounds like. And I do have to attest that, you know, having used uh, uh, this method, uh, you know, Paul's actually did the, the mic placement. It is it is the way. I mean, I, um, I really like the way, you know, I like to keep those overheads open and you're really uh, getting a summation of the entire kit um, and uh, the, the right placement, the right microphones. It's, it just sounds amazing in phase always. So, so Tim, when you, when you, um, when you're doing the different scenarios where you have to under mic the symbols versus the over, uh, overhead scenario, um, you know, when you're doing overheads, I imagine you're trying to get like what Paul was saying, the whole kit versus yeah. when, when you're going under the symbols, I think that kind of goes out the window, right? At that point, you're, yeah. only, you're only focusing on the symbols at that point, right? Honest, so Honestly, I was so unhappy with that, that I really didn't use them. I used the ride uh, microphone and I relied on the stereo uh, rhythm mic, which sounded very pleasing, actually. It was a very soft sound and um, added a lot of you know, had a little, had a lot to the snare sounds. You know, it was, it was a, it was a good thing. Um, it wasn't what I was really looking for, but it was still the result was really nice. And the, the perfect phasing of that, you know, uh, the actually I have. I don't know if you could see, but it's a XY ribbon head to head there. Um, so it's a fixed stereo pattern, and you know, it's uh, it sounded really nice. <clears throat> that's great yeah i've got one of the uh royer sf12s uh that i use on drum overheads a lot and it's the same yeah. xy and works yeah. fantastic and it is yeah. and great image and, and really works very good well. image it was really great well. great for the uh monitor engineer and, and the drummer just loved the way it's yeah, yeah i think drummers that, love those a lot yeah absolutely um so <clears throat> carrie's uh guitar setup you're you're mostly fractals, right? Or do you have any real amps yes, on stage? Not a one. Uh, actually, the the steel, <coughs> excuse me, the steel player has a you know a small amplifier. Uh, actually, it was you know buried down in the stage in a, in a uh, ISO cabinet, but that was the only actual you know analog thing going on. <laughs> and is, uh, go ahead. Well, is, is, do you like that? Is that your preference, or would you rather have real amps, or what? What do you oh, your much, much prefer real amps. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, what our sound was excellent you know um it was uh perfect for this type of show um you know uh there there really was no home position for the guitar players you know there's no amplifier you know they're they're moving and working the entire stage throughout the entire show so there's no place for a pedal board uh you know the only home position thing may be like a vocal mic for you know one of the, one of the guitar players who's a singer uh so yeah all the pedal changes all the all the lead patches all that you know is, is happens remotely and for those reasons that's the right system for for that type of band now you know, i much prefer you know uh, a, a real amplifier and the right microphone you know and that, what what's your what is your preference microphone wise if you do have a real amp um again it, it depends on the the vibe the the type of uh music 
we're playing, the, the, the guitar player, there's so many variables. <coughs> um, but again, I, I tend to avoid the, the, the dual miking thing. You know, I, uh, yeah, in a controlled situation, yes, you can get a really great sound, but you know, I, I've had so many issues with that sound changing after I walk away <laughs> that right. it's just beyond my control. So if I can get it with one microphone, that's where I'm going to go. And that has everything to do with placement. So I, I would say my go-to, uh, you know, under any situation, again, the DPA 2011C, um, you know, that's not going to, I, I, I'm not going to lose with that mic. Um, there are other mics I would use in certain situations, but that would be my first choice for sure. Um, I do like a rhythm mic on, on you know, like a, a rhythm mic's a great way to get, if you have a thin sound, edgy sound, uh, that's a great way to soften that up a bit and add a little bit more bottom. So, yeah. You know, but that's you're coloring the sound at that point. You know, that's a tool. That's a that's a that's a paintbrush. <laughs> right. And what about um vocal mics? What's your uh, go-to vocal mic? <clears throat> oh gosh, uh, we had Carrie on the uh, de facto. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the it was the. Uh, 4018 VL. Uh, VL is the uh, the flat response, uh, lit for L for linear, I guess. Uh, they have another, just the V has a slight uh, bump in the top end there, but uh, we, we stuck. I, I really liked uh, the flat uh, response of, of, of that mic. Um, you know, Carrie's got an extremely powerful voice. Uh, her mic technique, <clears throat> uh, you know, she could she pull that microphone out at an arm's length and her full voice, you know, she's just pegging the input. Um, so she really works that mic. Um, and in all situations, it doesn't matter if she's right up on it, uh, arm's length away, she you still have the fullness, the full proximity effect is there. Uh, and just there's nothing you could do to that mic that that it's just always in phase. Whatever it hears it's 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 a it's hearing it well <laughs> that's the only way i know how to put it in a non-technical way uh you know you get off of axis on a lot of mics you know the at the edge of the pattern it just you know it, things don't sound like well that's not the case you know with these mics it's well the other really why i like them. the other thing i really noticed with the de facto's is that um they they're they're musical not i mean of course of course they sound great on the vocal right. but the ambience they pick right. up from the stage if you've got a loud stage there's some that's mics that sound great on the vocal but the the background ambient noise is just exactly. really harsh or edgy and it's like man that de facto it's it's all music everything coming out of it that's my point exactly my point yeah i mean uh you know even if it's going to hear something else on the on the stage you know other than your desired input it's going to hear it very well you know it's going to be in phase it's not going to be right yeah, yeah you have that yeah that edgy that off -axis yeah, thing, yeah, yeah off axis sound yeah <clears throat> so it's a yeah. uh, pretty interesting as far as that goes yeah well um i know you made uh the um oh, i guess we should encourage people i think i think you said something at the beginning chris but uh people can type in questions if anybody has is at home watching this and you uh uh want to ask any one of us a question you know feel feel free to, to type it in and um and Chris will uh, funnel it to us. Um, but uh, I know you made the move to uh, Ravage consoles a while back. When did you start mixing primarily on Ravage? Myself, uh, actually on the carry tour. Uh, it was the first time I actually toured uh, with, with the Ravage. <clears throat> and uh, God, I just love the way that it sounds like an analog desk. I mean, you see behind me is the, you know, the MCI and, um, the rabage with the with the silk, uh, the, you know, basically is emulating transformer, and you know, it just gives you that great analog summing, and uh, you know, that's the whole reason why I love the desk. Really that's do. great. And do you think um, so? It goes hand in hand with your love for old analog, yeah, you know, analog console, or you know, it's not. It's it's it's. Uh, I love the fact that the silk is not like. A plug-in, uh, you know, it's 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 a feature of the desk, um, and it's 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 can be very subtle, uh, but it's 
you know, something that I, I want to put on every channel. <laughs> you know, I, I, it, it just gives it that wonderful analog warmth. And, uh, you know, that's really what, what I'm looking for in the, in the console, yeah. That's great. <laughs> um, and how else do you use the console? Do you combine, are you using some vintage analog gear along with the console? Or are you using just the console on its own? Or how? what are you doing there? Um, almost every time I set up front of house, I mean, I always have some sort of uh, <clears throat> analog, uh, you know, external processing. Um, but you know, I like to, I like to do I like to do analog summing and and and, and you know, mixture groups and but I, but this desk I got rid of all of it. <laughs> I'm not gonna say all of it. I, I kept my I kept my um, analog signal chain for Carrie's vocal. Um, mostly because it's a wonderful choice of analog stuff. Um, and it's always right there at my right hand. Um, it's more of a convenience thing than anything else. Um, yeah. it's just something that I've just, this is the way I'm accustomed to mixing, you know, having that analog signal path, uh, for my artists there. Uh, a couple of other small things I did, uh, uh, just because I could. But I found that staying in the desk, staying in the box, so to speak, um, just gave me better results with, with this particular console. Um, I didn't feel the need, you know, to have to, to fix anything, so to speak. <laughs> that That's great. Sense. Yeah. What What is her um, analog channel? Can you tell us all the, <clears throat> the components in that? Yeah. I. Uh, I start with the uh, API, it's, it's called D-Channel Strip, uh, which is sort of a, it's a combination of a couple of 500 series, a couple of 300 series, uh, uh, some, like the lunchbox uh, type of uh, uh, component. So it has, uh, it has a 512C preamp, 527 compressor, 550A equalizer, and I think it's a 312C line driver, all built into one unit. Uh, and it has uh, an insert uh, path that uh, I insert. <clears throat> I have a uh, Empirical Labs Little Freak. Uh, that's a really, really nice analog EQ. Uh, I kind of go to that for, for more of the precision stuff. Uh, use the, the API EQ for more of the broad, you know, just a broad thing. Um, but, you know, again, once I found the perfect EQ for Carrie, I addressed the PA first. You know, I mean, it was, it was, uh, we really had a great design and we didn't have to fight the PA washing the stage despite being in the round and everything. So it really wasn't an issue. Uh, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's where I'm at with that, actually. Uh, well, working with uh, one of the best vocalists performing today is, uh, you know, only makes it easier, I'm sure. Uh, but there is a vocalist. but there are a lot of dynamics there that you got to oh, uh, you got to rein in. And, and uh, talking, speaking about her mic technique I, earlier, uh, she has another style that's not so desirable. She kind of grips the the microphone rapper style. Um, and that's another kind of a little bit of a bonus we have with the de facto. The way that the capsule sits, it sits quite high in, inside uh, the windscreen. And uh, we stressed to Carrie, like, you know, uh, we don't want you to change your style. But we're going to ask you to stay below that band. You know, you keep your hand well, on the bottom side of that band. We're going to be just fine. <laughs> And she did. She's all about it. That's great, man. And you can see all the different uh, variations of her mic there. Which does she always have the same one on each song, or does she just is it based on how she's feeling that day, or how does that work? Uh, I was same, same, same. I was. These were all for uh, wardrobe uh, changes. Uh, so it's so based everything. on what she's wearing. Absolutely. And uh -huh. uh, there are so many different changes. You know, throughout the set, she comes up through lifts and different positions and. You know, the mic would be placed on a lift uh, uh, before she gets there. So, yeah, it, it, it was same, same, same every night. You know, it had for it had to be for automation purposes. Yeah. Right. 
<clears throat> so, so Tim, we got, we got a great question coming. Uh, how much time do you spend listening to an artist's album before you go on the road with them? Oh, endless. <laughs> I mean, endless hours. Um, it's, it's to the point of obsessive. Um, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with whether you like it or not. You know, you need to be able to communicate with the, the, the musical director. You need to be able to communicate with the band members. You need to know every note of every song. And I, I do. <laughs> it's just part uh, of the gig. How, how early are you getting stems from them? Or is it just listening to the record and or comparing stems to the record and what's changed? How does that process go? Um, uh, so it's, it usually starts with the record. If there is anything definitive uh, that's changed for the show, you know, if the MD is arranged, you know, I'll try to, to speak with them. Uh, but for the most part, you know, all that stuff's ironed out in rehearsals. Uh, but, you know, mostly I'm just going for album material. And uh, sometimes the artists provide it. Sometimes, you know, you just have to get it on your own. But you have to acquire it no matter what. Sure. Yeah. It's like, it's, 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 I would say it's like homework, but it's, it's more important than that. <laughs> well, there's people, there's great engineers who've lost, uh, lost gigs for not knowing the oh my God, yeah. material. For sure. Absolutely. So yeah. it, it's, it's, it's part in, of it. Very important. Important. Mm -hmm. Um, were, so were you there for the whole switch when, when she switched to the de facto for her vocal? Was that something you led oh, that, or was she on it before you got in the camp? Or? Totally my choice. Um, I don't want to drop the name brand of what we were using before, but it was not the right tool for her. It just wasn't. Um, I understand why it was used. You know, it was, uh, for monitoring purposes, um, but it just was not the right tool for her. Uh, the way she works that microphone and the way that previous mic would change with the, with the proximity effect and what the, her grip did to it, uh, it just was not the right tool. Um, so we were very happy with, uh, with this choice, and so was she. Very, very happy. Tim? Tim, who turned you on to the de facto? Do you remember? Ah, well, I used to mix Enrique Iglesias, and uh, I'm sure you know of Eddie Kaipo. Oh yeah. Uh, I worked with I worked I was the front of house guy when Eddie was hired, um, and that was I guess we worked together oh a couple two three years before I ended up leaving in 2000. Oh, might have been as late as 14. Ah, I'm not I'm not good with the dates, but. Uh, uh, Eddie's a fantastic guy, and when uh, Brad got on board, I'm not exactly sure who in, you know brought DPA on board with Enrique, but uh, they've had a long-term uh, relationship, and uh, <clears throat> you know I'll always be great friends with Eddie, and uh, I heard him talk so highly of the de facto uh, that was when I was looking for a mic for Kerry. That was my top choice and uh, you know i really have a lot of respect for his opinion and uh we gave it a shot and i just loved it cool yeah cool. that's awesome so um it's great to hear what you use on her vocal you know this outboard <laughs> insert stuff what are, if you're if you're not going out of the console which it sounds like that's basically just her vocal you're doing that with uh, for other channels are you using plugins a lot in the in the console or are you using just the channel processing or how do you uh what are you using on the uh on the other uh, inputs uh, i do i use a couple of uh of the onboard um uh plugins um nothing <clears throat> nothing outboard no waves you know none, none, none of the external stuff just just sticking with the onboard uh plugins i really like the 1176 uh i mean I had, I, that's my go-to compressor for kick drum. I mean, that's, it's so fast and, you know, I get the, the texture and the tone that I'm looking for. I just, it's just my go-to tool. And, uh, you know, I had an outboard when I started with. And, uh, you know, it, it did its job, but it just added so much noise. And, uh, you know, it was audible, you know, when it happened, I'm just sitting there idling in the house. And uh, so I just... For fun one day tried to try the plug in and it's like oh my god this is awesome <laughs> so yeah. I was, you know, they, they really did a great job with it i mean it behaves exactly like the hardware and without the 
hiss and, and, and noise. Yeah, it's pretty uh they spend a whole lot of time. It's not a, it's just crazy the amount of uh energy they put into developing those plugins and um which it pays off because they, they do a a really, really good job. Yeah. Um and I yeah, I think it uh it shows, you know. What reverb you use on her uh voice? Uh the uh well I actually was on uh, a PM7, so it didn't have the onboard TC stuff. Uh, so I had Claire give me like uh, three uh, six thousand units. To, oh, nice! To, you to had cover to cover up for that to make up for that. Yeah. So it's you know basically the same. Uh, I forget the, what that that verb is called, but you know that you can only have like two on one engine. I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's amazing uh, how much DC, DSP that thing uses. But it sounds absolutely stunning. Um, and one thing I actually forgot to mention when I was talking uh, uh, Carrie's uh, hardware signal path uh, was the most important part was, <laughs> was the uh, TubeTech uh, uh, CL1B. Uh, you know that is was the magic that really uh, smoothed her voice out, took all the edge out, and you know that was that was my, really my go-to piece that's inserted into the API. You know, I forgot to mention that. <clears throat> Yeah, that's that's a great piece. Oh, it's amazing. It just is. And I do use a couple of other plugins. Uh, I, I love the EQ4. It's that's uh, Yamaha. That's an amazing. <clears throat> it's it's uh, you know unlike some of the other like the the Wave C6 and C4 and that kind of thing. I mean, it's it those, those are all uh, crossover based. But this is uh, the, the, just the phasing and everything. It's just way better with the EQ4. I really like that very much. And the uh, 5045, I, I, I use that extensively. Um, yeah, that's great, too. It really is. It really is. Uh, one of the, you know, uh, the only feedback issue that we've had would be a little bit of low mid coupling, you know, when Carrie would get into the center. Um, 250, 300, a little of that would build up. And uh, the 5045 just addressed that really, really well. It's really nice. It's a great piece. Um, do, you, do you use the fifty forty five on anything other than vocals at all? Um, I have. Um, I just put it on a piano before, and it was amazing. It really sounded great. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes you have a little, you know, feedback issue, uh, resonation mostly, and uh, it, it really helps with that tremendously. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's an interesting piece of gear. It really is. I've used the hardware version of it uh, in, in other situations as well, so I was quite familiar with it. Used it with Kenny, actually. Yeah, it's a. I mean, the hardware <laughs> thing was, I, I couldn't. I mean, I, I used it forever. Right, right after it came out, I couldn't believe how how great it was, and then I was really excited that it was came out in plug-in form. And the plug-in yeah, yeah. is exactly <laughs> like the hardware piece. You know, if you know how to use the hardware, you set it the same, and it works the same. Exactly. That's yeah, cool. my start start setting. You know, it's like, oh, well, that works great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so going back to the Kenny Chesney uh, tour before, because that was massive, right? Was it was it all stadiums? Oh, uh, we would uh, the the mo was we'd leave on a Wednesday night. Uh, Thursday would be we'd cram whatever we could into a shed. Uh, all the trucks would show, you know, and whatever we could get in there, we'd cram in there. Um, and then uh, Friday would be. Uh, we, we would arrive at the stadium on Friday. That would be, uh, so ahead of us would be the production team and, you know, they're there. It takes them a week to set the stadium rig up and, you know, that's way involved. So we kind of slide right into their production with our stage and, and, uh, uh, PA and everything. And that flies on Friday. Usually by Friday night, we're doing a band sound check Friday evening and Saturday is all the opening acts. Uh, setting up, uh, sound checking, and doors. Well, our first band was on by five in the afternoon, and uh, it was it was a well oiled machine. And every show looked like that. Man, that, that's that, just that, crazy. Every show, every I think show I can was see sold you out down there, Tim. <laughs> I can see him right there. <laughs> see him with the cap on. So that was uh, that was Kansas City, and you know that's known as one of the loudest venues, sports venues on the on the planet. You know the, the crowd noise. And literally, you know, we made it a point to <clears throat> to uh, to set our smart rigs, you know, very accurately. Uh, I measured 118 dB A weighting 
Oh. The crowd noise. I wow. mean, crowd wow. noise at front of house. 118 <laughs> dB. Hey, waiting. That's just insane. I mean, it was, I had to put my fingers in my ears because it was so freaking loud. Yeah. That's and, crazy. And we were with the Nexo rig, oh, 102 in front of house, you know, doing our, doing the meat and potatoes. So, <laughs> it, and it was Nexo on the whole tour? Yes, 2016 was Nexo. Uh -huh. oh, that's great. Um, wow. And that's huge, yeah, too. That's, that's, uh, that's stage left at Bristol Motor Speedway. And you see how everything's kind of pointed up in the air. Uh, main hang, side hang. Uh, in the center there is the steered sub array. So you see half are facing rearward and half are facing forward. And uh, what they were trying to do is to steer that outward at a 30 degree angle and sort of null it in the center a little bit. And the ground subs would take off from there. And all this was... Uh, it, you know, it, it, it helped control the low end on the stage so the band wouldn't have to deal with all that. Boom, boom. And, yeah, there's, uh, they've got some pretty amazing steering uh, capabilities. Yeah, yeah, we had great results. You know, uh, uh, there's the, we had stunning sounding shows thanks to Chris Sullivan. Systems That's Chris. Chris. He's as, he's as <laughs> good as they get. <laughs> A little shout out there. <laughs> um, oh, that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> And then and you went straight from Kenny to um, straight to Kenny, uh, straight from Kenny to Kerry. I did some. I did Steven Tyler in the in in between that for a bit. Uh, his solo thing with uh, the Loving Mary band, uh, based out of Nashville here. And whoa, man, what a great tour! What a great band. Um, we did uh, mostly Europe. Um, did a summer in Europe and and did did, did some, some some work in the states as well, but it was a great tour, uh, really neat vibe and some great people on that one. That's yeah, cool. I was working on the. Did you do CMA Fest when he played? No, I wasn't on that. that no, that has yeah. been right before me. Uh, I um was working on the broadcast truck for that, and um, they were out sound checking in the afternoon, and I was so impressed with how well he could communicate with the band and they were working out a couple of details oh, for yeah. the show. And he was, you know, sometimes with a front man, you don't know if they're, you know, super musical or if they're more of just a singer kind of guy, but man, he knew exactly what he wanted and he was completely, uh, uh, you know, great communicator and worked through this stuff and was, I Absolutely. mean, it was really, really impressive. Yeah. He talks to talk. He, he's, he's been around and you know, a lot of people, you know, know enough to be dangerous, um, you know, but he's, uh, he, he could really talk the talk. He's a, he's a good guy. Yeah. And I could tell he really, uh, he was respectful of everybody too. And it was really great to see him. I mean, I don't know. He's one of my, you know, I'm a huge fan of his and, um, uh, and you're always a little afraid when you get around somebody that you're a fan of, that they're going to really disappoint you and let you down or whatever. Right? And, and he was just the opposite. It's like, yeah, that's the kind of guy I was hoping he would be. He's, he's <laughs> respectful of everybody. And he's also super smart and, you know, and, yeah. and it was really, really great. So, <laughs> um, well, so are you going to continue with uh, Carrie once? Uh, um, once yeah. Um... yeah, that's the plan. We don't have any definitive work right now, of course, but uh, um, I will continue on with Carrie uh, 2021, and uh, we'll see what that brings us uh, as far as touring goes. But uh, you know, typically she has every third year would be her grand tour, and uh, where she pulls out all the stops and you know does this one of a kind set, and you know. Just her big, big tour every about every third year, and then she does a couple of other slower years where she's where she does so many other things other than just music, uh, writing books, and you know she's got her right her clothing line and her her uh, she's just got so many irons in the fire. Yeah, she's a busy busy person. <laughs> And, and Paul, so what are you doing? Um, um, is there any new stuff on the pike? I I want you to mention that um. It was amazing to me that so quickly when um, COVID struck and there's this whole new um, that DPA came out with a a package which is not specific. I mean, this is not a music thing, but you guys came out with with a interview setup that's made for social distancing and everything. Can you talk about that yeah, a little bit? Absolutely, yeah. So the uh, the 4097 interview is is what we call that, and basically it's um, it's a, a miniature shotgun mic. 
uh, in the same form factor as uh, one of our instrument mics, so kind of like a 4099 with the, an adjustable you know, gooseneck. But the neat thing about it is it attaches to a about a six and a half, seven foot retractable boom pole that uh, it's, it's all just designed and, and very elegantly put together so that, you know, you can capture the interview or, or whatever that happens to be you're trying to grab, keep the social distance uh, and not feel like, you know, you're, you're going to be compromising your audio quality because of it. So it's, um, it's, it's a really neat unit. Um, yeah. And, and, and the team in Denmark who, who put this together so quickly and, and, uh, in really it was, it was in response to what was, you know, what we're all going through and, and wanting to help people continue to be able to work and because we need to, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. But I mean, to, for a company to be able to jump on an immediate need that quickly, I think it is pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Well, thanks. Yeah, no, we're, we're proud of it. It's, it's doing well. And, um, uh, and it sounds great too. Yeah. Well, so, uh, no, no surprise oh. there. <laughs> uh, Tim, we got a good question. Uh, Paul yeah. Pavan said, when positioned in the VOM, do you need any acoustic treatment uh, to separate uh, further from, from the house? Uh, yeah. Um, so it's always a compromise. You're not going to get, you know, this perfect situation on the road. Uh, so I carried with me, uh, well, what I ended up with as my constant, um, like right behind the desk, I would put up... Uh, a pipe and drape I'd always get from the house, uh, just to stand. And I had two heavy packing blankets that I would clamp to this goalpost, so to speak. Uh, and yeah, you can kind of see it there. It, it, it would provide uh, sort of a baffle area right behind my speakers. It was a constant thing. You know, that, that setup was the same every day. Um, now, if I was in an unfortunate situation where there was a wall behind me or something reflective, I had more packing blankets I could fix to the wall. Uh, but that was my constant setup, what I looked at every day uh, with that that blanket uh, black hole, black hole area right there. And it did make a, quite a difference. It was it gave me some consistency. Uh, it really did help. Paul, I got a question for you because uh, I've People ask me all the time, one of the most frequent questions I'm asked is, what's the best miking setup live for piano? What what do you recommend for for acoustic piano in a live situation? Yeah, that's a good question. It, it really depends on the type of performance I think that you're after or, or that you're that you're involved with. If it's um, if it's opportunity where you can, you know, go full stick on the piano um, I'm going to say going with something like uh, the 4018As, something like that, where it's in a super cardioid pattern. The A preamps are going to give you all of the transients, all of the detail that you're looking for, yet maintain a high level of rejection of secondary sound sources on stage. And to be honest with you, those, those capsules in that setup will work um, in much more challenging positions, obviously. Um, but... Um, that that would be my go-to on stage is is the 4018 A's. If you have opportunity uh, to go with a wider pattern, absolutely go for it. Like the 4015s or even into an Omni. I've used the miniatures, the 4060s, uh, with the lid all the way down in live situations, and have had great success with that. Oh, I think I've seen. Uh, is it a 4099 that has the magnetic mount? Yes. Uh, used yes. in a piano. Uh, now, I don't know about the mic choice, but that mount, I mean, to be able to put that microphone literally anywhere you want it almost in that piano, it really Absolutely. was priceless. I love that about that mount. Yeah. And that's another great solution, too. It, you know, obviously, like the form factor itself, it's super yeah. low profile. Yeah, yeah. You can position it, it anywhere if you want it, like over the hammers, or you know, yes. if you want to do like an XY, it's very, very spread versatile. Spread it apart. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good. Choice. And you could, and 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 you know, some people insist on the lid down or at the you know lowest position too. So. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, which is, I mean, usually fairly. I mean, yeah, I don't think a piano ever sounds best with the lid down, but sometimes it has to be. If you've got drums on stage, yeah, it's really hard to have a the yeah, lid yeah. even even the low setting is is 
difficult. I mean, it's almost necessary to have it all the way down if it's a loud band anyway. Right. Ooh, I just thought of something uh, a little bit off subject, but uh, uh, your miking technique with the hi hat and the forty. Oh, that's a great yes. idea. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, forty ninety nine on the underneath side of the hi hat. I just right? love it. Yes. So, what I'm doing is I'm I'm using what we call our universal mount with the forty ninety nine, and that's basically a a, a Velcro style. Uh, attachment that attaches itself to the underneath shaft portion of the hi-hat and what I'll do is I'll just position the microphone because of the fact that it's in a super cardioid pattern I'm going to use the null points on the mic to my advantage so what I'm doing there is I'm aiming the null points towards the snare so it's complete rejection of the snare and grabbing only the hi-hat at that point it's amazing. I mean, sometimes, you know, the, like the back of cardioid, you might have two little nulls there. One, you know, at right, one right at the snare, one right at the, the wedge, if there's such a thing. It's perfect. It's it's amazing. I mean, it's, I just couldn't believe when I pushed up the fader, I heard only the hi-hat. I mean, that's cool. It's, it's That's amazing. Cool. Yeah. I think, I think our pad might have uh, liked that one as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That was fun. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Very cool. Well, um, any other uh, DPA things coming out in the near future you can tell us about? Oh, we've always got things in development, which is really mm -hmm. neat. Um, we're, we're focusing in and around uh, a lot of the components for some of our miniature microphones right now. Uh, so you'll see more accessories, different things like that coming out uh, soon. And... Yeah, you just you just never know. There's there's some fun things in the works. So hopefully, if um, if Nam happens this this next January, Tim, I hope to see you back on the main stage <laughs> hey, because that would be super fun. It may be the next gig I do. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, we'll, hopefully we'll have something to introduce at that time. Yeah. Right on. Well, well, it's really exciting to me to um, as a longtime fan of DPA. Um, and of course they've been ultra respected in the studio world forever, but it just seems like for whatever reason, unless it was an orchestra, they didn't take off in the live arena until the last, you know, handful of years, five or six years. And now you see more and more people using them. And, um, and I think that's awesome because it's, it's like, they're just as well placed in the live world as they are in the, in the studio world. And, um, and I think people are, are, are realizing that. So, um, well, it's, Absolutely. it's really great. Well, and it's 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 guys like yourselves, you know, that that are in a sense paving that that road, you know. And I think that that when you start to understand that you know phase linearity is so important on stage, and Absolutely. when you're mixing and matching different types of polar patterns with different manufacturers of microphones, there's a lot of variables that are unknown. And, and it becomes really difficult to maintain a, that level of control. At least it is for me. Absolutely. You can kind of yeah. overcome that, you know, in the studio a bit. But live, right. oh, absolutely yeah. not. Everything yeah. has to play well together. Yeah. The other thing that, <clears throat> at least what I look for in a live environment, is capturing the source as accurately as I possibly can. So for me, it's... It's totally different than in the studio, you know, a studio, I can, I can play with that color palette, you know, like Tim, you mentioned earlier, like with the paintbrush to an extent, mm -hmm. but, you know, when it comes to the high pressure of, of having to move quickly, having to achieve sounds and go, you know, oftentimes in the live environment, I want to capture what's there because then I'll know that at least then I'm accurate, and then I can mess with it all I want after the fact. Right. But my source is going to be true to what it's actually happening on stage. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Well, Chris, how are we doing? Doing good. We don't have any further comments. Uh, so, what's uh, you know, just make sure you guys check out um, the front of the house Fridays podcast, Sickles and Noise podcast, uh, Personal Podcast um, Network. We have a bunch going on. And um, I appreciate you guys hanging out with us today. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been a, good, a good conversation. Thank you. Oh, one quick question I just saw pop up. 
Um, what DPA mic do you like for a banjo? <laughs> I don't. Anyone? I don't think we like banjo. <laughs> we love banjo. What are you talking I'm about? I'm just kidding. <laughs> is there one that's that's great? There is one, right? The forty ninety nine with the acoustic guitar uh, clip. You know, yeah, it's not necessarily even the acoustic guitar clip. Either the uh, the drum clip sure. works really well on it um, yeah it's like it's a drum rim actually it, of course. exactly yeah. yep so i'll i'll um i'll actually use that in between two of the restrainers and 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 grab that yeah that works really well if you're in a studio environment and you want to go with a little bit larger diaphragm i love the 4018 yeah good question <laughs> now we know <laughs> all right well thank you guys so much for being part of this and uh Really, uh, really appreciate you taking your evening and um, and chatting, and it's been really, uh, really, really great. So, um, and everybody at home, thanks for chiming in and um, and uh, and wish you a good evening. Chris, thanks for yep. making us all welcome. <laughs> Not a problem. Take care.